Hi, good afternoon, good evening and good morning to everyone. Uh, please uh, let us welcome you to our special interest group uh, presentation from the IMRS, um, a webinar talking about lifeboat and rescue boat launching appliances, inspection, usage and safety. Uh, for information, my name is Danny Shorten. I'm a member of the Institute and I also for my sins work for a company called British Engineering Services Asset Reliability. And we have interests in many industries, one of which being the marine industry. So I'm very happy to be here as your host and you'll be happy to note that I won't be speaking for very long. Um, today's expert is uh, an eminent expert in this area, Christos Papalot. He's an experienced marine engineer. He's got over 20 years experience in regard to this particular topic, and I'm sure you'll find his uh, presentation engaging. It is a technical presentation, and it is specifically in regard to the important management of uh, launching appliances, etc. Now, before I hand over to Christos, may I please remind you that we are taking questions via the Slido software system, for which you'll find a link in the uh, chat. So click on that and it'll take you to a page where you'll see the SIG webinar listed and you can submit your questions there. Now, for ease of management, we won't be answering them as they come in, but I will be moderating them and we'll have a good Q&A session at the end. Now, if in the event that we get uh, a lot more questions than we're able to answer, our intention is to collate all the questions and pro provide answers either via the SIG or as a separate response email direct to your inboxes. So please, uh, please ask any questions that you wish to do in the knowledge that we will answer them all. If not online here, then we'll definitely answer them uh, after the meeting is closed. Uh, right, that's enough of me. Uh, may I please introduce Christos Papalis, who will carry on and further uh, introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Danny. Uh, my name is Christos, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming here this afternoon, this morning, or tonight, whichever time zone you seem to be. Uh, today, we'll be discussing about launching appliances. Launching appliances is one of the three links that govern uh, survival craft uh, launch. Uh, and the three links are namely the survival craft itself, the launching appliance, and the release gear. Um, as, I, as I said previously, today we'll be discussing the lifeboat and rescue boat launching appliances. And in particular, we will discuss the brakes and the brake mechanism, the remote operation of, uh, of the launching appliance, deck operating device, the David structure, the wire rope, the wire rope drum, and we'll touch briefly on the hooks and the survivor club. Uh, this presentation is mostly technical and is intended for um, crew members or uh, superintendent engineers, but anybody with a technical mind can uh, uh, watch and understand the, the presentation. Hopefully, by the end, you should be able to have an understanding of how the brakes and their mechanism uh, work, the key points to inspect on a launching appliance, and also to understand the importance of always supervising, inspecting technicians on board your vessels. This is your equipment and uh, you are primarily responsible for them. There is a tendency because annual and five-year inspections are done by third parties for the crew to consider this something out of their reach. And uh, this is not true. Hopefully uh, we will demonstrate tonight how easy it is to inspect and operate this uh, equipment. So you have uh, your safety at your own hands and do not trust anybody uh, with uh, with these um, uh, safety issues. So let's start. First off, I'd like to, to go through the regulations uh, concerning the brakes. And this is the LSA code chapter six in particular, launching and embarkation appliances. Um, the LSA code specifies two kinds of brakes on all launching appliances. Um, the centrifugal brakes, will, which control the maximum speed of lowering, and we'll see some pictures and discuss this um, further on, 
and the normal brakes, which are uh, responsible for controlling the lower of the boat. Um, I need to mention also that we're discussing gravity launched uh, boats today and not hydraulically launched uh, launching appliances. So with these two in mind that all launching appliances that are gravity launched must have both the centrifugal brake and the normal brake, let's, uh, let's proceed to see how they look and how to inspect them. This is a general overview of a twin David launching system. And here you have the brake housing. This one is the brake lever. This is the brake weight, which always keeps the brake lever in the closed position. So the brake is always applied. This wire here is the remote control wire that you use from inside the survival craft to launch in case that all the crew needs to embark on the survival craft. Um, this wire here is very important, although it gets omitted many times. This wire connects to the deck operating device and uh, we'll, get, we'll, we'll discuss about this uh, device later on in, uh, in this lecture, but uh, the um, SOLAS states that when you launch a survivor craft, you should be able to see where you are launching it. And if I stand in this position and lift up the brake, I have absolutely no idea what is happening over the race. So the deck operating device is, an, is either a handle or a lever close to the rails, which is connected through this wire to the brake lever. So once I push or pull, this wire will move downwards and the brake will be released. Okay, centrifugal brakes. As the name suggests, they, use, they are um, working using centrifugal force. The centrifugal brakes are spring-loaded. So once you start lowering the boat, this one starts turning. Once the centrifugal force is greater than the force of the spring, the centrifugal brakes will move outwards and touch on the brake housing. You can see here the shiny part of the brake housing. This is where the centrifugal parts are touching. Uh, the the important thing to understand is that it will not stop the lowering of the boat. The boat will keep lowering. It will just cover the maximum speed. So instead of uh, the boat going at 100% of its own speed, it will go with 85, 90%, and depending how strong is the centrifugal brakes. It's a kind of um, a backup mechanism, let's say. Let's say. And uh, you can have either brake pads, which is friction pads, like uh, the black uh, line you see here, or metal parts, metal to metal. What you need to check in the um, centrifugal brake when you make the inspection, first of all, you check the condition of the spring, if it's rusted, uh, if it's uh, soft, if it's moving outside, if it's not stuck, if this pin here is in good condition. You put a, a screwdriver and you try to lift up the brake using your own force to see how it's operating. And if the brake parts are worn out, you can see this one that we have minimum four millimeter until we reach the securing bolts. So this is a good centrifugal brake pad. There's really nothing, nothing else to check here with the centrifugal uh, brakes, only to keep in mind that in all gravity launched um, uh, launching appliances, you will find them. If it's not in the main brake housing, maybe it's on the back, but you have to uh, open and inspect them as well. Okay, normal brake. What is uh, controlling the lowering of the boat? There are two main types. The first one is the eccentric um, type, and the second one is the clutch type. Um, when I say eccentric, uh, I don't mean in the sense of uh, someone wearing their trousers inside out in public, but in the math sense as in off center. Uh, and this is, this is the normal clutch type that um, you get everywhere, even, uh, even in your cars. Um, there is also another uh, type of, of brake, the conic brake, 
And um, I've stated here popular with Chinese makers because in vessels that were made in China under a Chinese uh, classification society, uh, I found this kind of breaks in, in all of them. What, what is strange for me as an engineer is that if you use um, a flat surface brake pad, once you apply it, it's applied. The conic one, you see here the darken area. This is the area that uh, the brake is touching on the brake housing. And it's quite a large area because you need to create a lot of friction to hold the boat. But if the brake pads are even half a degree different than the conic inset the brake housing, instead of having a nice overlap here, you will have a single line running across and it may not be able to hold the brake. The only reason I can think of using such a kind of brake is that the maker will force you to buy its own um, consumables. Because if it's, a, if it's a flat brake, you can change the brake parts anywhere in the world. But with the conic brake, you need to use the maker's original to make sure that the angle is uh, correct. OK, the eccentric brake. As we said, eccentric in the sense of off-center. How it is working? This is the brake, and this is the brake pad. Oh, excuse me. And this is the brake pad. Once the eccentricity moves towards the brake, the brake will rip the brake drum. This is where the friction occurs. This is the brake drum. So eccentricity is on the side of the brake. The brake moves away. It frees the mechanism and you start lowering the boat. Once the eccentricity is from the other side, then the brake is applied and you stop the boat. And to have a, um, a picture of uh, what it actually looks like is this. You see the, the um, distance here is much larger than the distance here. Here is almost zero. So in this, in this case, once this is on the shaft, on the brake shaft, and you turn it in this position, the brake will move outwards. If you turn this anti-clockwise and you bring the small eccentricity here, this will move inwards and the brake will be applied. This is how it looks uh, standing up and this is how it looks on the brake drum. So if I turn this and the big eccentricity comes where is the brake, it will move away from the brake drum. And if I turn this on the other way, and the small eccentricity comes where is the brake, the brake will be applied and stopped. It's, it's a very simple uh, mechanism that uh, is easily to understand. When you, when you adjust this brake, you must make sure before you put the brake handle that you have manually with your, with your hand close the brake until it has contact with the um, brake drum and then you can make the adjustment. But more about the adjustment uh, further down in the presentation. Okay, what we need to check about the brake pads. The first and most important is the brake wheel. In the second picture, you see that uh, until we reach the securing bolts, we have two to three millimeter difference. This is a normal brake. In the first picture, not only the brake pad got worn out, but this is the head of the securing bolt. Already metal from the head of the securing bolt start chipping off. This will result in damaging the brake drum or the brake housing. And in the end, we will not be able to hold our survivor craft. So what we need to check is brake wear. And because we are not using the survivor craft or the launching appliances a lot, maybe three, four times per year, this wear is not something that uh, will happen overnight, but the crew needs to keep this in mind. And once they see that uh, the wear is, uh, is gone off limits to order new ones, don't rely on the service technician that came to inspect. This one I have found on a, on a vessel and for sure it, it goes like this for more than five years. It's something simple that you can check yourselves. Now, the clutch type brake, how it operates. You have a worm wheel, this one. 
And this word will is attached to the brake handle. The brake handle goes on the back of it. Now, the worm wheel goes inside this threaded flange. The flange has a cut on its circumference. This cut here, this cut of the flange is going either, is going to a steady point for sure. This steady point can be either on the brake housing or on the brake housing cover. So you put this cut, this slot inside uh, this uh, shaft. And you do this so that the, the flange, the branch flange, cannot rotate. Now we have the worm wheel inside. Once we turn the worm wheel either clockwise or anti-clockwise, because the flange cannot turn due to this shaft, the flange will move either inside or outside. So when it's moving inside, the brake will be applied. When it's moving outside, the brake is released and we can launch our survival craft. The clutch type brake consists of one or multiple brake disc. This is the brake disc and at least two or multiple brake flanges. In essence, the brake disc is sandwiched between the brake flanges. Please notice the, the splice that on the brake is faced inwards and on the brake flange is faced outwards. This is so because when you apply the brake, you need to connect the shaft with all the exterior moving parts and to block them together. So once this brake is sandwiched between these flanges, the, the, in, the inner spline, which is connected to the shaft, will be connected to the outer um, part of the gear that is not moving. And in this, in this way, we will stop all movement of the wire drum and the boat will stop lowering. In, uh, in some cases, instead of having uh, inner splice like this one, what you have is these um, uh, protrusions on the brake flange that goes on keyways on the um, brake shaft. So instead of having splines, you have uh, protrusions that go inside the keyway. And in this case, you have the brake to have external spline to attach itself on the outer uh, immovable part. And again, when this is sandwiched between, when the brake is sandwiched between the two brake flanges, all movement stops. Um, here I have a, um, we have the drawing of uh, what I described earlier. This one here, this part here is the flange. This is the worm wheel. This one here is the worm wheel. So when the worm wheel moves, the flange will move inside or outside. When it is moving inside, here it is shown in the fully closed position. When it moves inside, this is a bearing. The bearing is touching on another flange and this flange is touching on the brake flange. This is the brake. You see the top of the brake, where is the spline, is connected to the outer immovable part, which is attached with bolts on the brake cover. This is the brake cover. These ones here are the centrifugal brakes with the brake pads. And this is the spring. And remember, we said when the centrifugal force will exceed the force that the spring exerts on the brake, the brake will move outwards, touch on the brake housing, and thus gather the maximum lowering speed of the survival craft. When we lift the lever, this one will come back. The brake flange will separate from the brake and we will have movement. On the other side of the brake shaft, we have a nut, a nut with um, safety. This is the second uh, flange and this is the second brake flange. So in essence, the, this flange remains stationary. This one moves and with the rotating speed, the brake will disengage from the 
from the aft uh, from the aft flange, and the board will start lowering. But it's very very important to have a very good um, clearance inside the spline. We will see pictures uh, later. And uh, this is how it operates. The other thing you need to um, to keep in mind is that when you close when you close the brake cover must be flushed against the brake housing, must have zero clearance. If you have clearance, you did something wrong. And 99% of the cases, something went wrong with the adjustment of the brakes. When you close the brake housing, you will need to open manually the brakes. So you make sure that this flange is not touching on the brake. Because if it, if it is touching on the brake, maybe you don't position correctly the shaft inside and you get little clearance here. And um, once this happens, it will lead to disastrous uh, results. So it's very important before you close and break type clutch uh, cover, you open manually, you turn with your hand here, you open manually the worm wheel so that you have distance here, you close, you see that it's flushed, and then you put the bolts and tie it. And once you tie it again with your hand, you tie the brake mechanism. You feel that it's touched on the, on the brake, and then you make the adjustment. Um, this is how the brake flange and the brake looks when it's, um, when it's together. The brake is sandwiched between the two flanges. One question now, if the brake is applied, how comes when we push the heave button on the motor that our survival craft comes up? Because as we explained before, once you apply the brake, there is zero movement on the shaft because the shaft and the outer immovable part are connected together. So how can we heave up the boat and when we leave the heave button, the boat stays in position. This is done through a mechanism that is called a one-way bearing or a free wheel bearing. How it operates? Look at the first picture. The one-way bearing has roller balls resting on a shoulder, on a spring-loaded shoulder. There is spring inside here. And the spring is always pushing the balls to come outside. You see, the distance here is much, much bigger than the distance here. So when the inner part, when the inner part of the bearing is turning clockwise, the shoulder is always resting on the ball and you can turn it. If you try to turn the inner part anti-clockwise, this ball will come here where the distance is less and it will stuck. It will not move can only move clockwise. But the exact opposite is happening on the outer part of the one-way bearing. If you try to move the outer part clockwise like this, then again, this ball here will come here and it will cease all motion. But if you, if you move the outside part anti-clockwise, then you can move it because the balls, the ball bearings are always resting on the shoulder. And this is how you lift up a boat. Uh, the shaft is turning, is connecting to the drum, and you can lift up the boat. If the one way bearing breaks, you, you, the, the boat will not fall down to the water because the normal brake is holding it. But if this is damaged, you cannot heave up the boat. Um, this is uh, this is the diagram of where the one-way bearing is. This is a limit switch. So when you put the manual handle inside, the winch cannot be operated. And this is very, very important to check. Uh, I think six or seven years ago, we had a fatal accident. Uh, one Filipino crew uh, died because they put the handle inside. Limit switch was uh, not working. Someone accidentally pressed the, the button for heaving. 
the handle turned and uh, broke his leg. And this is why we need to be very, very careful when we're doing uh, any work with any equipment. The safety measures of the equipment are there for a reason, and we need to take care of them to avoid this kind of accidents or unfortunate, uh, unfortunately deaths. But um, to return back to our um, discussion, this is the one we're bearing. This is the one we're bearing. This one is a gear, and this gear connects to another gear here, and this is the shaft that is turning the brake drum, the um, wire drum, I'm sorry. So once you give command either from the motor or from the manual handle, this one will start turning and cannot turn back because it's the one way bearing holding in position. These are bearings. You have one bearing here, another bearing here, and another bearing here, normal bearings to turn. In one memorable occasion, I had a, a ship owner call me from another country and he was telling me that uh, they service the boats by the maker, not maker's representative, by the maker. And uh, in three months when they tried to lower, the starboard boat did reach the water but could not come up. And I instructed him to use the manual handle. When he put the manual handle inside and he said that they cannot operate by hand, I asked him to remove the bolts of the cover and tell me what he sees. This bearing here, this bolt bearing was destroyed. Remain only two or three bolts inside. This one here was completely destroyed. Not, not even the, the inner part of the roller bearing we could find. And because the bearings were destroyed, this one was tilted and the gears did not make good uh, contact together. That's why they could not uh, heave it up. They replaced the bearings and we've been taking debris out from the oil sump for the next six months and were able to, to heave up the boat. Now on the, that was on the starboard side. On the port side, they could not lower the boat. Inspection was done, certificate was presented to them by the maker, but they, no, they could not lower the boat. And um, when I arrived uh, there and tried to open the, the cover, this is what I saw. Now notice the thickness of the silicone. It was about 12 millimeter thickness. And if we remember in the discussion we had before, we said that this has to be flushed. It has to be metal with metal. When you have this kind of silicone, it's not a good sign. I did remove the brake cover, but still the brake was holding. The boat could not come down. We secured everything. And um, after three exhaustive hours, I managed to remove the brake. And this is what I saw. The brake flange snapped like stale bread. It snapped. And it snapped because when they were closing, the brake and cut this distance here. My colleague unfortunately thought, okay, we have 12 millimeters clearance is not so important. I can always put the bolts around and start tightening and it will flash. But instead it destroyed the brake flange and look at the damage it did to the brake. We are talking about excessive force here. So imagine that they had both davits serviced. One, the boat could go down, but could not, could not come up. And the other one, the boat could not go down. Remember we talk about the, the spline and the clearance that needs to be present. This is the outside part that the spline of the brake goes inside. Look how little clearance there is. Look how little clearance there is. If there is any foreign material inside and the brake cannot move freely, it cannot separate from here. Will not be able to separate from the back flange. This one must be able to move inside and outside of the spline freely without any obstruction. 
Unfortunately, what happened, and I found this out when I tried to replace the brake, uh, for some reason I don't understand, he tried to paint the outside part, but he did a sloping job and paint, you can see here that paint is much thicker than here, paint dripped inside. So when he put the brake, the brake was stuck. It was stuck inside the spline housing and could not move freely. And that's why they could not lower the boat. This is why we need to understand when we are doing inspection. If you don't understand how your equipment is working, you cannot inspect it. On the other hand, this kind of equipment have such a simple mechanism that I cannot fathom that a chief engineer, a second engineer, or a third engineer will not understand once they have the manual and is compulsory to have the manual on board. Postal control can detain the vessel if they find out that you don't have the manual on board the vessel as per the new regulation MSC 402-96. You must have the manual. So the crew should take the manual, familiarize themselves, and they should start conducting their own inspections. Don't rely on the inspector, even if he is from the maker. You don't know, maybe he had a bad day at, uh, at, at his house. Maybe uh, his wife uh, shouted too much to him. May I, uh, maybe he came drunk. Don't rely on them. Always have someone from the crew watching what he's doing. And always, always demand to do a brake test. Lower the boat, catch the brake, and bring it up. Demand to do a load test. If they say, never mind, push them to do it. That's it regarding the um, clutch type break. Now we're going to see a few, a few pictures of uh, uh, damages or improper uh, conditions I have met during my many years doing this, uh, this job. This is a brake band. This is a brake band. You will notice that here the brake is cracked. The reason that is cracked is because they used a brake that was too thick here. So when it went around the brake drum, it snapped out. What is a brake band? A brake band is simply a, a piece of steel that is bended. In one side, you have the adjustment. On the other side, you have a steady point. And this goes around a brake drum. Now, look at this one. Look at the condition of the, of the brake. This one is, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. Look at the condition of this brake. And they're supposed to be inspecting it every year. How come nobody noticed? Because again, you have the, the question that the attending inspector might not be willing or capable of understanding this kind of issues. That is why the crew should make these inspections and inform their company that we need to change the brake band. Look at, uh, look at the adjusting a bolt, how, how bent it is. Inside was maybe one kilo of rust. I, I, start, I tried to remove it with a chipping hammer and then I, I used pneumatic uh, hammer. It was, was impossible to, to release just by the hand. It's something that is not extremely difficult to, to inspect. But unfortunately, sometimes people don't understand the, the importance of what they are doing. They don't understand that this might cause the life of a person. And the attending technician will go home and sleep in their beds, but you will be on board. So any, any vessel crew that is listening to this uh, um, presentation or superintendent engineers, please, please instruct your crew members, never leave the service technician alone. In my experience, 99% of the cases, 
when I go to a vessel, nobody comes with me, even though I demand one to be with me. And they don't, they don't take notice of what I do. It's like they are, okay, if I go inside the bus, I trust the bus driver that he will drive me normally. But if I see that he's drunk, I will take the wheel. You need to be alert. This is your own life at risk. And you need to take responsibility for this. Another, another uh, thing that uh, I found out, uh, this is multiple disc. When my colleague tied this bolt, the brake cracked, but he left it like this, no problem. Look at the next uh, brake disc. Not only is it cracked, all around, all around, the brake has gone out. This brake was not working. Look at the next one. Remember when we said that the spline and the, the female and the male spline should have normal clearance. Look at this picture and look at this picture. Look at the vast difference between the two. This is normal. This is what I found out. This was a new one. They put, the, the, they put this one inside using a camera to have this kind of we are here. So one more time, people that don't, don't really understand what they are doing came to inspect your equipment. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry if I sound uh, too aggressive, but um, safety is something very close to, to my heart. And uh, I believe that I, I'm a former seaman as well. There is one million ways you can injure yourself on a vessel. It is a shame to injure yourself or have some accident during training because someone did not spend one hour to understand how their equipment is working. And um, for the remote lowering, uh, remember we said in the start of the, of the presentation that this wire this wire goes inside the boat. So there is some danger. Let's say fire on the vessel. All the crew will uh, embark the boat. They will pull this with remote wire. The brake will open and you can control your descending to the sea, at least in theory. Look at this wonderful design. We have one, two, three, four, and another three pulleys on the, um, on the um, remote wire uh, column, a total of seven pulleys going from this wire inside the boat. Now, if one or two of these pulleys is stuck, is not working properly, what will, will happen? This. Please notice that there is no, nobody holding the brake. I opened the brake using my hand, and the brake did not come down. And it, not, it, it did not come down because these pulleys were stuck. So in case of emergency, what will happen? All the crew will go inside the boat. They will release the brake. They will not be able to close the brake again. And the boat will go full speed from stowing position until sea level. And this one is very easy to check. You just lift, lift the brake by your hand. Put in your procedures for the AMB at least once a week, lift the brake by hand, is it coming down? If it's not, remove all these pulleys and make maintenance. Look at the rust here. Look, look at the telebor, terrible, terrible, terrible rust here. Make the maintenance so that you will keep yourself safe. You will use this if you are very, very unlucky one time in your lifetime, once in your lifetime, not more. But if in this time of need, your equipment is not up to par, instead of saving yourself, you will get yourself injured or even worse. It will not take a lot of time to make this kind of inspections. The inspections that we're going to go through now until the the end of the presentation. For the brake is something that the engineers on board need to, uh, to take hold, or even the boss one is not, the mechanism is not so terribly complicated 
that uh, the embossing cannot understand. But this kind of inspections is something that you can easily do and avoid mishaps. Uh, next one, regarding the remote lower. Look at this. I don't know how to describe this. They put the wire inside the live port, correctly inside the live port. Look how they splice the wire, but let's forget about the splicing for now. No matter how hard you pull here, because this wire is outside, this wire will not be able to go inside. In theory, this weight should touch here on the nut. And when you lower the boat, the wire from the wire drum, the remote wire, is coming together with the boat. Here it will never happen. They will go inside the boat. The vessel is on fire. They will pull like crazy and no chance to open because you cannot get this wire inside the boat. And I don't like to comment on the brilliant guy who thought to put two nuts here. Really no comment about this. So remote lowering. Keep in mind that you need to check that the brake that the wire is moving freely on the pulleys so that the brake lever can return to normal position. And also that you put correctly the remote uh, lowering wire inside the boat. The support pipe. This was before launching the David. This was after launching the David. This, this is the head of yours truly. I was very, very lucky because this pipe felt about 10 centimeters away from me. Uh, if it felt on me, the, the, the picture here would be with a flathead. When I saw the David and how poorly maintained it was, I told to Captain that uh, uh, we cannot proceed with the inspection. And Captain was eager to show me how good that his David is. He released the brake, and at the first movement, the support pipe felt off. The only thing holding it was this wire to not crash on my head. This wire, thankfully, was uh, still in good condition. Look what happened. For some reason, in the past, they had to replace the, the top part of the support pipe. And instead of making a proper job, they make welding that a, a 15 year old going to technical school can do a better welding. They left it there, nobody went to inspect, and Corrosion and time took its toll, and this is what happened. And once more, imagine that you are inside the boat, you are trying to lower, and this falls down. I know it may sound uh, one in a million, but believe me, very, very often I see cases that normal people cannot believe that is happening. I mean, some of the pictures, if I haven't taken myself, I wouldn't believe. Uh, this is regarding the deco, deco, deco operating device. I apologize for the poor picture. This is a lever. This red one is vertical here. And on the other side is the deco operating. This one is this wire connecting to the deco operating device. So you have So you have the um, deck operating device, you pull the lever from here, the pull, the, the lever comes up or down and it pushes this wire to open the brake. This is the safety pin. This is stainless steel and I managed to remove after 15 minutes of hammering. Look at the, um, at the wire that was connected to the safety. It has a minimum of eight layers of paint. This vessel has just gone under five-year inspection, uh, class AMBS, and Server was on board. And I asked him, how many years before they someone tested the operating device? The wire was cut, by the way. When I tried to operate it, the wire was cut. That's why you can see this in, uh, in horizontal position. The crew did not know what was the purpose of the deck operating device. They did not know. It was right in front of their eyes, and neither the Boston chief officer, uh, safety officer, asked themselves why we have two wires here. 
why is there is one extra wire here instead of this one? Again, this is this is poor workmanship. This is not something to be proud of. It's an omission that this omission okay cannot cost you your life, but it's an omission that uh, if, if something simple like this you don't maintain and you don't understand how it's working, how someone will expect you to run a whole vessel? This is what I'm I'm trying to get at. Now look at the David. All these pictures, believe it or not, are from a single David. All of the pictures from a single David. Look at this kind of holes. Look at this kind of holes on the David. I don't know if the picture is clear enough. This is this is the bottom part of the David. From here until here, there is nothing. There is nothing, gentlemen and ladies. Only rust. The bottom plate of the one arm of the David was completely gone. And I ask you again, how many years did it take for this to happen? How many crew changed? How many people came and saw the rust spots there, but nobody said, let's put a chipping camera to see what is happening under the rust. Why were they waiting for me to do this? It's your own life again. It's your own life. Some people, they like to do inspections the easy way. They go on board, they take the money, they go home. This is, this is an ethical issue as well. People's life depend on it. But if you don't care that it's your own life, why do you expect that the attending technician will care? This is not something that the, the, the technician doing the annual or the five years should find out. This is something you should find out. Actually, this is something that the crew should never allow to happen. Once more, uh, I apologize about my tone of voice, but as I mentioned before, this is a, an issue close to my heart. And I'm really, I'm really stressed when I see this kind of, uh, of omissions. It's, it's, it's really unacceptable for me. Um, okay, brake housing. When we remove the brakes, we should see a clean brake housing. If we see any kind of, uh, of oil here, that means this oil seal that connects uh, the gearbox to the um, driving shaft is leaking, like in this picture here. A lot of oil, the seal was damaged, and oil was leaking inside the gearbox. When we have something like this, we need to remove the, uh, the brake housing and replace the seal. Now for the gearbox. This is about 50 millimeter of sludge. This sludge occurs because crew have the tendency, instead of completely removing and draining the oil, to top it up. Now you might say that, okay, it's just sludge. What can uh, what sludge can cause to the, the gears? At first, if some small part inside the sludge goes inside the gear, it can slightly damage this. But then again, you can have damage like this, complete teeth missing. Okay, this is not a camshaft, it's not a timing uh, gear, but complete teeth are missing. And these teeth could have fallen in any other gear and completely destroy the gearbox. So please, if you are a crew or if you are a superintendent, instruct the crew, when they replace oil, drain completely, open the cover, Put your hand inside, clean, and then top up. Don't just top up the oil. Then brake lever. It is always very important to have clearance between the brake lever and the resting place of the brake lever. And this is shown because as the brake pad gets worn, maybe you need to push then brake lever further down to have um, a better, uh, um, better friction to stop the boat. So always have this clearance. 
Now, this, what is wrong with this picture? The problem, gentlemen and ladies, in this picture is this wire. Please note that um, this one has compromised the feeding. And I saw the wire bending here. If we take a closer look at the wire, the wire is destroyed and the fitting is compromised. What happened? Although I was not there, I can guarantee to you that limit switch did not work. The people heaving up did not notice that the limit switch was not working. Wire passed through the opening. This one touched on the David and it only stopped when it compromised the feeding. This is scrap. You need to change the wire and do the inspection again. And speaking about wires. <laughs> I always love when I see this picture. I mean, imagine what kind of thought process goes through the captain's mind when he's inviting a third party to do inspection and he presents the wire in this condition. Not only is covered with, I don't know, I, I, up to now, I don't know what is this white substance, uh, truly gentleman. Look at how rust is the wire. Look at the spooling. I mean, this is, this is a picture of how not to do it or how to do it if you are drunk and under the influence of very severe drugs. Why on earth did you call me with this kind of condition? What did you expect to say? It's okay, well done, chap. No comments. Okay, lifting links. What is the problem here? The problem here, gentlemen and ladies, is that the hook is not resting on the bottom of the lifting link. It's, red, it's resting on the side. This is creating unnecessary stresses and should be replaced. When I asked a safety officer, he said, this is what Maker provided. And I said, Maker was wrong. Make it did provide this, but if you use your own eyes, you can see that this is not the proper equipment. Again, once more, do not rely on anybody else than your own experience and eyes when you are dealing with this kind of, uh, of equipment. And uh, last but not least, I want to discuss about cook kill connection. Every new vessel you go, please check the hook kill connection, especially especially if you have an open type lifeboat. 16 millimeter plates, 16 millimeter plates. This is normal. This was on the aft of uh, the rescue boat I, I inspected. If I show you the four connection, you will not believe. I did not believe myself either. Remember, 16 millimeter gentlemen and ladies, 16 millimeter. Look what remained, one and a half millimeter one and a half millimeter. This is what remained. It was holding only by rust. What is worse? This was a boat of a passenger vessel. What is even worse? They used this boat to put down passengers when the port was too big for the passenger ship to go inside. They were actively using this boat that was only holding by rust. And I ask, I put the question to you one more time. How many years did this stay like this? The vessel when I went to inspect was uh, 33 years old. I would say minimum 25 years. Imagine how many crew, inspectors, classification societies inspector, captain, chief officer, mates, third party inspectors. How many people went on board Nobody, nobody checked this thing. Nobody checked this thing and they did not check because they don't understand how to make a proper inspection. This is what is holding the hook. This is why it's called a hook kill connection. These plates here go on top where is the hook and this is holding down under the kill. And this is what is remained. This is what is remained. I don't know. Is your own equipment, gentlemen. One more time, it's your own equipment. You should not expect a third party, someone who don't really care about it to come and inspect it for you. Yes, it's compulsory to be inspected by the third party, but it's not compulsory to be inspected because it's impossible for the crew to do so. 
um, free fall boat. Water went inside the boat. Look, how many gears stay like this? This is galvanized. The nut went out and the securing place was removed from the boat. And this, this brings us to, to the end of our discussion, gentlemen. But before we, we finish, uh, first of all, I want to, to commit myself to what Mr. Danny said, any and every question I will be more than happy to answer. Any question we have regarding safety issues, I'm more than happy to answer. And if there is enough interest, I can make another presentation uh, regarding um, lifeboats, how to do uh, the simulation launching safely and how to do safely launching of the uh, survivor craft or discuss about survivor craft and again, the release gear. Uh, the personnel has to be experienced. Hopefully with the new um, regulations, uh, 23678, that sets specific um, path that you have to follow to become a certified personnel. I hope we overcome this, uh, this problem of having someone experience. You have to understand the mode of operation. If you don't understand how it's working, is no chance to make proper inspection or to op even operate it. And to understand this, you need to receive some training. It's not, it's not something difficult, but also inspectors like third parties such as us, we need to, we need to undergo training. We need to, to show to some, to whom now? I don't know. Anyway, as I said, I, I hope with the new regulation uh, 23678, this, this will um, will cease to exist because in the past we had people going for five days in a in a maker's um, uh, um, program and come back as engineers. In a memorable occasion, I had one guy who was a pastry chef. He was a pastry chef six months ago, and they gave, they gave him license to inspect the brakes of the of the engine. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm uh, once more. I'm, I'm really sorry if uh, if I'm uh, I'm sounding too emotional. Um, uh, I'm willing to share this presentation with with uh, anybody you like, and please uh, move it on as well. The more people see this, the less accidents will happen. I believe. I hope you enjoyed this uh, this presentation. Um, I apologize for my accent if you do not understand the certain things and uh, for my emotional commitment in this, but uh, really safety is something that we need to, all of us, we need to take care of. And I'll pass you on to Mr. Danny. Mr. Danny, they are all yours. Hey, Christos, thank you very much. That hour went quickly, I have to say. There was quite a lot of, a lot of interesting, what I call coal face detail that you shared with us. Um, just a, a comment to you, Christos. I personally love the passion you have for the safety angle here. I think this is to be commended. Uh, and although the uh, the um, possibly the um, frustration comes out in your voice, your passion is is clear, and, and that's to be applauded. Um, we have a few questions, if I may. I'd like to to ask firstly. A lot of the pictures we saw there. Many people might think these were unusual. In your experience, how how normal is that sort of ex, um, condition of some of these assets? These these look these look unusual. Uh, is it unusual? Um, regarding the brakes, because most of the time, to be honest, nobody is launching the survival car, so. Uh, you will not find a lot of damage breaks, but you will find a lot of breaks that have been put together wrongly. Remember I said that the brake pad should be sandwiched between the two brake flanges. I opened a vessel in, in April that they put all the, it was multiple brakes. They put all the brakes together and then they put on the outside all the flanges together. <laughs> and for some, I, I, I mean, it, it's mind boggling. Why, why you should do this? Why would someone do this? Um, regarding the, the brake lever not closing, 
I have made it in a number of vessels, yes. Especially when you have a terrible design from Maker like the one I showed. If there is many, many pulleys, chances are if you lift the brake lever, it will not come down. Um, spooling is another very big issue. Spooling is another very big issue with the, and um, almost none of the crew that, uh, this kind of presentation I do also when I visit the vessels, none of the crew knows about the dock operating device. Very, very few. They know that you must have some kind of lever or, uh, or a, a handle that you need to push or pull and lower the boat from the close to the rails. And another thing I forgot to mention, when you do the brake test, you have to do it using the deck operating device, not closing, not, not standing close to the brake, because this is the device you are using when you are um, lowering the boat in normal position. So some of them are not so, unfortunately, are not so uh, rare. Um, the, the really rare conditions, I didn't put them in, in my presentation. It's yeah. something that you encounter and you need to, first of all, the important thing is to understand who is operating. The other will follow. Yeah. I So another question which is uh, being asked is, um, clearly lifeboats are hopefully never needed. This, we, 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 we hope we never have to launch them seriously. But many, many assets, uh, fail because we don't use them very often, for instance. Now, if people are not routinely maintaining or don't know how to maintain this asset, then there are many, maybe many other similar deck-based assets, which are, for instance, painted far too aggressively, for instance, which is one of the examples you've had there. So what is the, the single one thing that a ship's chief engineer or, or the inspection crews could do to minimize these events? Okay, there is a bit of misunderstanding. Uh, what we usually do, if the regulations say you have to launch at least once per three months, then we will launch every three months. We do not need to launch every three months. We can launch every week if we like. And, um, If I if I, if I am a chief engineer on board and I know my crew is capable, if not every week, every 15 days, I will tell them, launch the boat, don't, don't go on the water, but launch it a couple of meters and bring it back. So we kind of see what is happening with the wire and so on. So we need to keep in mind that we don't, we don't have to do what is the bare minimum. This is our equipment. We need to maintain. So let, first we open the brakes, we check them in good condition, we close, we regulate, we check that everything is okay. Now we lower. We bring up back up again. Um, in one one occasion, I found a vessel. They have painted one uh, one barrel um, green and yellow. They named it Sam. And every time they were crossing the Atlantic, Sam will go overboard. And they will have a drill of capturing someone overboard. It was the only the only crew that they knew how to properly launch the rescue boat. And this because the captain was forcing it. If you don't do any real life drill and then something severe happens, you're dead. There's no chance you can do it. You have to do it beforehand. That's why you need to do the drills. Okay, it's so once per three months as per regulations. Do it more often. This is my advice. But to do it more often, you need to have the experience. Don't, don't say that this is something that we will put aside and we will uh, consider it only if we have some time. No, put it in your schedule. Put well, in your why, schedule. Why, why do you think that this is not in the culture of the organization? This is a big uh, question, Mr. Danny. This is a big question. I think that somehow the crew were terrified that if something is done by an external body, is something so complicated and something so terribly um, difficult to understand that they should not even think about it. Because we, 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 we are having a culture of, it's not my fault. I'm not responsible for operating this. I'm not responsible for maintaining this. Someone else will come and inspect it, so it's not my fault, but it is your fault. 
because when I come on board, it's like a picture in a single moment of time. I may sign everything that is okay. And before, before you make the launching, someone comes with a, a blowing torch and cuts the wire. You have a certificate that everything is working properly and nothing does. The inspection done by third parties are only to discuss like we are discussing here to find better ways of handling your equipment. Mm -hmm. And in the end, okay, put some sign and stamp. This is not to make you say, I cannot make anybody safe by coming to their vessel once per year. I can make them safe if I teach them how it works, if they understand, and if they follow the, if they have the feeling that it's my equipment, mm. it's my equipment, it's for my life, mm. I need to take care of it. I think Forget you, about who's responsible to sign the paper. I think you make a very good point because if I, Take, for instance, my motor vehicle in the UK. We, we have an MOT, a Ministry of Transport test, which is every year. And I, I respond if there are things I need to fix. And I do basic maintenance, but I don't do anywhere near the amount of inspections that, because I assume the MOT is going to cover it for 12 months, which I know as an engineer, that's not a sensible approach. Now, with, with lifeboats, for instance, which are critical assets and they are there to save your life in the event of a, a terrible situation these braking systems we we need to almost raise our understanding of, of of the risk of of the fact that these systems need to be maintained more aggressively and one of the questions that, that i wanted to raise from one of our visitors today was how how can we raise awareness of safety issues for braking systems is there a, a way that this information is shared or is it simply down to good practice i believe i believe that um, solas should force third party inspectors after they finish their inspection to go through of how they are equi the equipment on the vessel are working with the crew. They should force this. Unfortunately, many, many colleagues, they don't really care. And they don't really care because nobody can catch them if they do their job or not. The crew have no idea if they have made the inspection. They go there, they said, we inspected, please give us our money. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Thank you for the paper. Take your money and go home. So this is also a culture with the inspection community as well. Yes, yes, but the inspection community, you cannot, you cannot depend on a random person's goodwill. If, if it's forced, if it's forced to spend, because you really don't need more than 10 to 15 minutes. And it's not only the brakes, Mr. Danny. Um, imagine that uh, the brake lever that I, we previously, previously discussed, the brakes are in pristine condition, two pulleys are stuck, you raise the brake lever while you're inside the boat, and then you die. For two pulleys that are stuck, to take you five minutes to inspect. It's, it's a big issue. When I was a young lad and visiting vessels, safety officer was the most experienced. Nowadays, they put the younger one because the, the, the understanding is that safety officer is only there to plug on the keyboard and send reports. No, no, no. It's a very important job. And when you make drills, this is for, uh, for crew and superintendents, when you make drills, never use the same people to lower the boat. Even the mess boy should be able to do it because you never know in a real emergency who will be ready to assist and save your life. Even the mess boy should go inside the rescue boat and lower the rescue boat. You explain to them. But because people are afraid of this equipment and they're afraid because they don't have much experience with them and they think it's something that is difficult they are not doing it mm. i but don't know if this is a good, you're, you're, um, good, what, uh, good advice or not because but your, your advice though started off by saying that in the so last expectations that that could be amended to ensure that at, at the final part of an inspection that that those results are communicated to the crew directly and they have to sign off, for, for instance, that they've 
been given that information. Is that is that what you're saying? Yes, something like this. And when I when I make the break test, then the crew to come and make the break test uh, under my guidance or under their own. Normally, they should understand how to operate. But if they don't understand, to to spend 10, 15, half hour, spend half hour to explain to the crew is not something tragic. Mm -hmm. And even worse, don't ask money. Don't ask money to save a human life. How much cost does one life? No, that, 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 that point is is really an amazing thing to perhaps end our session on the fact that actually how much cost do you put on a life that's um an extremely extremely good point and I, I thank you for making it um i think we'll possibly run over a little bit um i'd like to thank you personally for the presentation i've learned a lot and i've enjoyed your passion i think it's the passion is good to see um, I would also like to remind you of one of the statements you said right at the beginning of it when you were talking about eccentric breaks. I laughed out loud when you said that it wasn't about wearing your trousers inside out in public. So <laughs> I'm going to try and remember not to do that in future. <laughs> well, uh, in one uh, in one of my presentations, uh, I had someone asking me what's eccentric about it. And I was showing him the picture, and then I realized that he he made it in a in a metal way. Of course, yes, yeah. Now that I I just wanted to lighten the mood, actually, after ending on such a sober <laughs> and uh, important point. But thank you very much indeed, Christos. Thank you indeed. Thank you for allowing me to do this presentation, Mr. Dan.